Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hello, my name is Tammy, and I am an alcoholic. <laughs> Like, all the nerves settle down just a little bit, just getting the first words out. So <clears throat> my sobriety date is December 10th, 1995. So the last sobriety chip I picked up was my 24-year uh, anniversary chip. And I will would like for you all to know that I did not mean for that to happen. Uh, it tells us on page 100 uh, that if I persist, remarkable things will happen. When we look back, we realize that the things which came to us when we put ourselves in God's hands were better than anything we could have planned. And I know that's my experience, uh, because when I came in here in 1995, all I wanted was to get out of trouble. That was the goal. I just wanted to get out of trouble. I didn't have a problem with alcohol, didn't really want your solution. Thank you very much. I just wanted to get out of trouble. Um, and thank goodness that God's plan trumped mine somewhere along the way. And now I can look back and say that page 100 is my experience also. Um, I do come from Houston, Texas. Um, uh, I have a home group uh, in that area. I feel like I'm echoing. Am I talking too loud? <laughs> So um, I have a home group. My home group is the Atascacita group. The Atascacita group is on the northeast side of Houston. Uh, if you're ever on the northeast side of Houston, give me a call. We'll go to a meeting. We have meetings at uh, noon and 6 every day, except on Sundays, because we can't make it too easy, right? Um, it's been my home group for probably about the last uh, five, six, seven years that I've lived on that side of town. Um, and I, I love the group. It's one of those, like, old AA groups, right? The little building. It's, somebody painted it uh, Big Book Blue, but they kind of missed the mark on the blue a little bit, so it's kind of like this really bright, bright blue. You can't miss the building. Um, but uh, it's got all the old couches al along the perimeter, right? All the donated couches with, you know, we put covers on the chairs and the cushions are all sunk in and all the donated couches. And um, I sit on the chairs. The couches scare me a little bit. But, um, yeah, and when I first started going there, you know, however many years ago, five, six, seven years ago, whatever, it was a smoking group. Um, we don't have really almost any smoking groups in the area. You have to get pretty remote to find a smoking group anymore. But um, it was a smoking group when I first started going there. But they had a non-smoking section, you know? <laughs> Y'all have these groups, right? Yeah, what it looked like was a red line painted on the floor, like towards the back. And there were a couple of tables over there, and all the smokers sat right on the other side of the smoking line and blew smoke at the non-smokers. But anyway, so we don't smoke anymore, but we still have the red line, of course. And um, I know I love my home group. We have a lot of book studies, a lot of, uh, you know, 12 and 12 big book, you know, as Bill sees it, um, you know, a lot of the book studies. And uh, I love that because I'm a personal believer that if we read something out of our AA literature at the start of our meeting, we have a much better chance of the topic staying on the solution and on sobriety and not on some random other thing that somebody may bring in. So I love the fact that uh, we start a lot of our meetings with reading out of our AA literature. Um, I also have a sponsor. Uh, she is, she's is. she been my sponsor for the last three years, and she is my uh, fifth sponsor in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, possibly my sixth sponsor, if you count that little period there where I was sponsoring myself. Um, <laughs> you guys have done this, right? So they do this in Virginia, too. Good to know. So, um, yeah, I did that for a couple of years. And I don't know what your experience was like, was like with that sponsor, but my experience was abysmal, right? Like, worst sponsor ever, that girl. But anyway, um, I, I got, got smart and moved on eventually. But, uh, the, but Tara's my fifth sponsor in Alcoholics Anonymous. I always love to hear stories from people in general who come into AA and latch onto a sponsor and they've had that same sponsor for 10 years or 15 years or 20 years. Or I love those stories of those long-term relationships with sponsor and sponsee in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I think they're great stories. Uh, it's not my story. <laughs> my story is I'm on my fifth sponsor uh, in Alcoholics Anonymous, but that's just, that's just the way my story unfolded. So... Uh, I also sponsor women in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and, um, you know, to, to see the light come on in a newcomer's eye is a joy we don't want to miss, right? And uh, I'm sponsoring three girls uh, around my hometown right now actively, and I have a girl that I sponsor who's in prison, and I've been sponsoring her for about five years, and I sponsor her by mail. 
And so over the course of the last five years, this girl who's in prison for a very long time uh, with me through the mail has worked all 12 steps. Uh, she has worked all 12 traditions with me. Uh, and we are now reading the service manual uh, and the 12 concepts of Alcoholics Anonymous. So she's willing. And as long as she remains willing, I can be willing to write some letters and to do some AA work with her. And uh, it, is, it is so amazing to see when someone is incarcerated and they want what we have, right? They want this program, but they just don't have the opportunities that we do just to go to a meeting and work with a sponsor and do all that stuff. Um, and she's willing. And so it's been uh, fantastic to work with her and see that happen. Uh, I have this other young lady uh, that I sponsor, and uh, she's one of those that, um, you know, uh, she just had so many questions and so many doubts when she came into Alcoholics Anonymous. She was 29 years old and she was just really uncertain. And when I first uh, met her, uh, she told me, she said, Tammy, she said, I just don't know if I'm an alcoholic. And I said, well, I don't know if you're an alcoholic either. Like, that's not my job. My job isn't to tell you if you are or you aren't. And, and she was like, okay. And then, you know, early days, she was just like, so like caught up in it. She would call me in a frenzy and just be like, Tammy, what? I just don't know if I belong in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I was like, well, I just don't know if you belong in Alcoholics Anonymous either. She's like, well, what do you think? And I was like, well, I think you need to stick around and figure it out because I don't know. And okay, okay, okay. And then she'd call me in a frenzy and she'd be like, Tammy, she'd be like, what? She'd be like, I just don't know if I belong here. I just don't know if I'm an alcoholic. I just, da, 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 da. She was like, what do you think? And I said, I told you, I don't know. It's up to you. She goes, I really need to know what you think. Tell me what you think. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to give this girl something, right? And so I said, here's what I think. I've heard enough stories in Alcoholics Anonymous and I've heard your story. And I think it's more likely than not that you have earned a seat in Alcoholics Anonymous. She said, okay, okay. And then she called me in a frenzy and she's like, Tammy. I'm like, what? She's like, when you say more likely than not, do you mean like, <laughs> do you mean like 51% or 99%? <laughs> and then I contemplated killing her and just kill, you know, whatever. So. <laughs> she's alive. Don't worry. She's alive. But anyway, so I was like, okay, here's what we're going to do. You ready? She's like, yep. And I was like, okay, here's what we're going to do. We are going to work. We're going to continue to work the steps. You're going to continue to do the work. You're going to continue to read. You're going to continue to meet me. And we're going to work the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And over the course of the next few months, until you, until you, and if you pick up a six month chip, you cannot ask me this question again. I said, we'll work the steps. We'll go through this. And you cannot ask me this question again until, and if you get your six month chip deal, she said deal. And we work the steps, right? And we work the steps and we go through the steps and we, we do the work and everything. And, and she gets her six month chip, right? <sighs> and by then she's mostly convinced about this, right? And I would like to report to you that last October, I gave that young lady a five year sobriety chip. I didn't think that was going to happen. You know, <laughs> like I wouldn't have pegged that one for sure. Right. But that's not my job. Right. That's not my job. My job is just to say, here's the book of Alcoholics Anonymous and here's my experience, strength and hope. And I'll share it with you. And your journey is going to be your journey. And my journey is going to be my journey. And uh, she's dear to my heart. And it was such a pleasure to give her that five year tip. You know, I sure didn't think it was going to happen. Um, I believe in all three legacies of our triangle, you know, our recovery side that tells me about the 12 steps, our unity side that tells me about the 12 traditions and our service side that tells me about being of service to Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, if I could live in a side of the triangle, I always say I would live in the service side because I love being of service to Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I remember early days, people talking about doing different service positions at their group or this or that. And I was like, who has time for that? Ah, whatever. And, um, you know, now I live in that stuff, you know, now I just totally live in that stuff. Um, I'm currently serving my home group as the assistant secretary, so I take minutes and I attend the group conscience. Uh, at the district level, I'm our CFC rep, which means I take them information about corrections and what's going on with corrections uh, at the area level. Uh, at the area level, I'm serving my area, which is Area 67, part of the Southwest region, as our area registrar. So I do all the record keeping and keep up with all the GSRs and groups and make all the updates. Uh, and I'm also a longtime uh, member of our corrections committee. I've been taking a meeting into a women's prison, uh, Plain State Jail, which is in Dayton, Texas, on the far northeast side of Houston. Uh, I've been taking a meeting into Plain State Jail once a month on a Wednesday for over 10 years now. So it's uh, it's kind of my passion, and, and it's what 
and it's what somebody else's passion. Did you hear him? So, <laughs> so uh, it's what I, I mean. It was. It would be all I would do. Like if it was up to me, right? If it was up to me, I'd just do corrections work. But uh, I enjoy general service work too. Uh, I enjoy enjoy doing all that. So. Uh, thank you for having me here this weekend. Thank you, Dave, and the committee for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor to be asked to do anything in Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, thank you, Katie. Katie is delightful, and I, I've already uh, enjoyed the time that we've spent, and I look forward to having some more meals and um, spending a little bit more time with Katie. Um, let me give you some fun facts. Like, fun fact number one. Today, February 14th, uh, is my belly button birthday. So... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I am 48 years old today. So when Dave called, he's like, we want you to speak on February 14th. I was like, ah, it's my birthday. How fun. So, um, yeah. So, <laughs> so it's my 48th birthday. And the last sobriety chip that I picked up was my 24 year sobriety chip. So I have now celebrated more sober birthdays than I have otherwise. So <laughs> celebrated over half of my birthday sober. So that's fun stuff. It's, it's fun stuff. I was like super pissed off about getting young, getting sober young, by the way. But today I'm like, wow, so cool. So <laughs> yeah, uh, it's been, a, it's been a great day too. I got here, uh, I got here last night cause I prefer to come in the night before and just kind of, you know, chill and stuff like that. So I got here last night and I woke up this morning and I was like, Oh, I should get up. And I was like, why, you know, <laughs> I don't have anything to do. So, um, so I slept in, which is delightful to me, of course. And, uh, then I had enough coffee that I was like, Ooh, I'm ready to go do something. So, so I got up and I put on my tennis shoes and I walked down to some little central area down there. Uh, I did a three mile round trip walk and, as I was walking down there, I saw a little coffee cafe, and I was like, I'm going to get some coffee, get a little latte, and um, and then I walked by a spa, and I was like, it's my birthday. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was like, hey, hey, little spa, do you have any openings? And uh, I was like, I want to get a facial, and she's like, okay, let me check that, that. We can get you in, and I said, great. And she said, for a few dollars more, you can have a massage, and I was like, okay, it's my birthday, you know? <laughs> so... So I had a facial, and I had a massage, and I had a latte, and I had a nice brisk walk, you know, there and back, and uh, and then Katie saw me walking on the sidewalk, and she's like, get in the car, and I'm like, okay, so, <laughs> so, uh, but I had already done all that, and it was fun, did a little bit of shopping, like, it was just, it's just been, the weather was beautiful, um, it's just been, uh, it's been a beautiful day, I've, I've had a beautiful day, the whole thing has just been fantastic, thank you for having me, this was exactly what I wanted to do to spend my birthday, so I, um, I appreciate being here, and I appreciate y'all having me, so, um, so why am I here, huh, like, how do you, how do you get here, right, and so, uh, I am a drunk driver who killed somebody in a car accident, so right now, is like the moment where you all say, thank God, right? A um, couple things I want you to know about that. Um, it happened on June 6, 1995. It was, uh, it'll be 25 years ago this, this coming June. June 6, 1995. Um, I was 23 years old. I was driving a brand new car. I was driving extremely intoxicated, and I caused a horrible car accident where one woman lost her life and three other people were life flighted at the hospital. What I really want you to know about that night though, is I did not mean to do that. I promise you, I did not mean to do that. So what it took me a really long time to figure out and to understand about that night. And I think once I figured it out and I understood it, it was too hard to say it out loud. But what I know about June 6, 1995 today is that on that night, I just didn't care. Like if you would have stopped me on the way to the car and said, Tammy, you could hurt someone. You could hurt someone. You could kill yourself. You could kill someone else. I would have said, leave me alone. I have somewhere I need to go. I have somewhere I need to be. I have no idea where it is, but I know it's not here. I know it's not right here right now. It's just somewhere else. And so 
I didn't plan for that to happen. I didn't do it on purpose. I didn't mean for that to happen. But what I know today is that it wouldn't have mattered if you would have told me something could happen. Right? It was June 6, 1995. I was 23 years old. I was driving a brand new car. I was driving too fast. I was driving in a blackout. Um, I was going somewhere. It was actually the second time I wrecked my car that night. Um, I, I had was in a one-car accident where I smashed in my driver's side door earlier that night. Uh, got home, was really upset, called home, said, I want to go home. And they said, are you okay? And I said, I'm fine. If you know me, you know that I am always fine. Thank you very much. Um, I said, I'm fine. And they said, come on home. They didn't know. They didn't know. They thought I was upset. They didn't know I was drunk. Um, so I got in my car and had that second car accident that night. Uh, the police came on the scene. Uh, I didn't know what had happened. I found out later. Um, they said, will you do a field sobriety test? And I said, no. And they said, well, option B is we're taking you, we're going to take you to the hospital to give blood. So I got in the back of the police car and they took me to the hospital to give blood. Um, my blood alcohol level came back as a 0.23 at six o'clock in the morning. So, um, and then they took me to the police station and videotaped me doing a sobriety test. And then they finally let me call my parents and took me home where I found out later what had happened. Um, you know, that car accident happened on June 6, 1995. And you might not remember my sobriety date yet, but I'll tell you it's not June 6, 1995. My sobriety date is December 10th, 1995. When I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I was telling you guys, I am not an alcoholic. That could have happened to anybody. Could have happened to anybody. Probably could have happened to a bunch of you, right? It's just an accident. It didn't make me an alcoholic. But when I can look back with clarity and know that six months later is my sobriety date, know that I was driving with a 0.23 alcohol level and blood alcohol level at six o'clock in the morning in a brand new car, like, yeah, it uh, leaves all the questions behind. So I was charged with four felonies. I was charged with one charge of intoxicated manslaughter and three charges of intoxicated assault as a result of that car accident. Uh, over the course of the next few months, we went back and forth and on October 13th, 1995, I pled guilty to those four charges. As a result of me pleading guilty, I got a 10-year probated sentence, all four of them running concurrent. Uh, they told me I had to go to a safe fee, which, is, uh, which was, they told me it was treatment. So I had to go to this place called a safe fee, which they told me was treatment, and then I had to go to a halfway house, and then I had to go to outpatient after that. Um, once that was done, I had to go to three AA meetings a week and get my paper signed. I had to do 180 days in jail, which they let me do on the weekends. I had to do 500 hours of community service. I had to pay back $16,000 in restitution to the families who were injured in the car accident. I had to have a breathalyzer in my car for the entire term of my probation. Um, blah, blah, blah. I'm sure I forgot something, but it was a just fit. You know what? I remember after all of that was said and done, the 10 years probation, the weekends in jail, the breathalyzer, all that, all I remember thinking is, thank God they're not sending me to prison. Like, I would not survive in prison. Thank God they're not sending me to prison, right? <clears throat> and so that was October 13th, 1995. You might remember my sobriety date now because I just told you a minute ago, but it is not October 13th, 1995. <clears throat> my sobriety date is December 10th, 1995. Uh, so even put on probation, you know, even being put on probation as a result of the actions um, wasn't enough, right? The last time I drank alcohol was December 9th, 1995. And um, I will tell you, I was a blackout drinker, uh, but I do remember just enough of that night, and I remember just enough incidences to know with no uncertainty that I hope I never see that girl again. Like, I hope I never see that girl again. December 10th was the first day that I didn't have a drink. Um, shortly thereafter, uh, they let me stay out to spend the holidays with my family. Uh, and shortly thereafter, I turned myself into county jail to go to this place called a safe fee, which they told me was treatment. So uh, I turned myself into county jail. And I walked into county jail, and I had a big book with me. Now, I didn't have a big book because I ran out to the AA store to get a big book. I had a big book because someone had said, here you go. Maybe you should take this with you. And I was like, okay, why not, right? So, so I took it with me. And so here I am in county jail, and I'm there for two weeks waiting to go to this safety place, right? And, um, and one day, 
I don't know why. I didn't open the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous because I woke up one day in jail and said, maybe I do have a problem. Uh, I probably woke up one day in jail and said, I don't have anything else to read. Maybe I'll read this blue book, right? So uh, I somehow end up opening the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I somehow get to the steps. And with like a half a second sober in the program, with a half a second sober in county jail, uh, the first time I read the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, they looked something like this to me. Okay? Step one, we are powerless and our lives are unmanageable. And I look around my jail cell. <laughs> And I say, I think I'm doing fine. <laughs> no problems here. We're good. We're good. And then I get to steps two and three, and they even reference the word, word God, preconceived ideas and notions, flood to the forefront, want nothing to do with it, move on. Four and five starts talking about inventory, like this is a completely foreign concept. I can't even wrap my head around it. Whatever. Move on. Uh, six and seven, character defects, right? Shortcomings, character defects. So I read steps six and seven and think about some character defects and shortcomings, and I have a very similar reaction, right? Like, I can't think of a one to put on my list. So <laughs> I am doing good through these steps, aren't I? Yeah, I am buzzing right through, right? And then I get to steps eight and nine, and there was something about steps eight and nine that actually grabbed my attention, just the whole idea of creating harm. Obviously, there's a whole lot of harm that I just told you about, but, you know, I was thinking about the fact that my parents had really stuck through me through all the trials and the, the courts and, you know, gave me money for lawyers and did all that stuff, and they really kind of, you know, it was very foreign to them and very difficult for them. And so, um, so with my half a second without drinking in county jail, deciding that steps one through seven don't apply, I wrote amends letters to my parents from county jail. So if you are new to Alcoholics Anonymous, I would like to tell you we don't do eight and nine first. We do not work steps eight and nine first. It is not how it works. Uh, numbered for a reason, okay, just FYI. So, uh, but that's what I did. And uh, anyway, so uh, I still love steps eight and nine. I love all the steps now. But anyway. So that's what I did. Um, and shortly thereafter, they came to get me to take me to this place called a safe fee. So they'd get me from county jail to take me to the safe fee. And I don't know if you have safe fees here in the state of Virginia, but in the state of Texas, we still have some, not as many. And I will tell you, I was in prison. So they, whoever they are, they lied, right? So I walk in, they were like, you know, give us your street clothes, here are your TDC whites, here are your TDC boots, you will walk outside the line, um, we're going to call you by your last name, you're going to get up when we tell you to get up, you'll eat when we tell you to eat, you're going to either go to work or go to school, and you have your groups, and here are the rules, and here's the regulations, and anything that you do wrong, there is a pretty strict consequence, so um, just don't do anything wrong, right? And so that's where I was. And I was like, holy crap, what happened, right? Um, like, I, I swear, the first week I sat on my top bunk and just cried. And I was like, oh, my God, I don't belong here. Why am I here? I don't belong here. And all the other girls are like, suck it up, sister. None of us belong here, you know? And no sympathy. No sympathy from the girls in prison, right? So, <clears throat> right. So, um, you know, I, I don't actually have a lot of good stuff to say about safety, to be honest with you. It was, uh, I, I think that, I think that prison is designed like that, though, you know? I don't think you're supposed to come out and be like, oh, it was a wonderful experience. I can't wait to go back. So, I think it was by design, but, yeah, you know, what do I know? So, uh, anyway, so, you know, what I do know today is a couple things. Like, uh, one thing that I know is I think it was the exact level of humility I needed to get to, um, to eventually some of this stuff to sink in with me. Um, and the other thing, the other thing that happened there one time was like my, like the ego is so funny, right? So they make you take this, this intake test to figure out your education level and if you can go to school or whatever. And uh, I already, I have my high school education, so... I didn't qualify, but you have to take this intake, intake test anyway. So I took my intake test. Who cares? So I get my little job. Uh, the first job that I have in prison is on the field squad. And what that means, did I break it? <laughs> I guess I wasn't supposed to tell that story, huh? <laughs> Which one is it? This one? Oh, I fixed it. <laughs> I don't know. I just touched it. I didn't do anything. Did 
did you see him? That look he gave me? He was like, what did you do? <laughs> Goodness. I don't know what happened. I, I'll try to stop moving. But um, So the first job that I had was uh, the field squad. And what that means is they give you a shovel and they take you out to some remote random place and say dig, right? And I didn't even know what we were digging for. I swear to you today what I think and what I've convinced myself is we weren't digging for anything, right? We were just digging to dig because you had to do something. And so we're digging and whatever. Who cares? <laughs> so uh, eventually I got a, a little bit better job. But um, anyway, so this, this girl that I knew, she was in my pod, she worked in the education building and they had all the test scores in the education building. And she came up to me one time and she was like, Tammy, and I was like, what? she was like, I'm going to tell you something. I'm not supposed to tell you this. And I was like, oh, okay. She said, you scored higher on that intake test than anybody has ever scored. And I said, yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> Like, do you know who I am? <laughs> of course I did, right? I am somebody amongst the prisoners, let me tell you. <laughs> anyway, so that's it's partially true story. I don't anyway. So, <laughs> so no. So anyway, like I said, I, I, I it was a miserable experience, but um it was what it was, and they eventually let me out because they had to, and um, it was a nine-month program. I was there for nine, nine months, they so let me out, so, uh, and then I went to the halfway house, and then I went to outpatient, and then I started going to AA meetings and doing everything that I was supposed to do, so at this point, I've been sober for, <clears throat> at this point, I've been sober for uh, like a year, I guess, uh, a year, a little over a year. And when I first got out, I had to start doing all these other things. I had to start doing my community service. I had to start going to jail. Uh, I went to, I had to do 180 days in jail on the weekend and it takes one year and two months to do 180 days in jail on the weekend and go into jail every single weekend, uh, Friday to Sunday. And so I did that for the first year and two months and I was working off my probation and I had a job, uh, and I had my family around and, and of course I met a man, right? So I got this boyfriend. He's my soulmate. Life is good. I'm doing everything I'm supposed to be doing. Uh, got everything going on. And so I don't know if you were listening to all that I just said, right? I'm doing this and I'm doing this and I'm going here and I'm doing that. And there was no sobriety. There was no steps. There was no God and any of that, right? So I was going to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous uh, because I was court ordered to. I had a paper I had to get signed, and I had to take it back to my probation officer. So, um, so I was going to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, but showed up when the meeting started, and I left when it was over. And I thought you people were nice enough, but I didn't want to hang out with you. So, um, yeah, I was doing all those things. I was doing my community service. I was doing everything. I had a sponsor actually. She was a friend of my stepmother's, and she started writing me when I was locked up. Um, and she had like seven years sober, but she didn't go to meetings anymore. She didn't go to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I was like, she has what I want, you know, <laughs> like, this is a great relationship for me. This is perfect. <laughs> I didn't work any steps and she didn't make me cause I didn't want to, like, it was great. Right. And I worked a step every now and then when I felt like it and. I mean, you know, but everything was fine. I had this boyfriend and I had this job and I was doing, I was busy, you know, doing all these things I had to do and, and everything was just fine. It was fine, right? It was fine until, you know, inevitably something happens, right? Inevitably something happens. And when I was five years sober, something happened. Um, and what happened is, you guys had been telling me to build a foundation in Alcoholics Anonymous, and what I had been building was this relationship with this man and with my family and doing all these things that I was supposed to be doing. So then when all of these human beings failed me, which they're bound to do, right? They're bound to do it. They're humans. It's not their fault. I'm not mad at them. It happens, you know? But I had not been building a relationship with you all, and I had not been building a relationship with the God of my understanding, and I had not been participating in my sobriety. I'd been hanging around AA. I hadn't been a good member of AA, right? And at five years sober, when all of those human beings failed me in the same year, which I used to think was really a coincidence that all the human beings failed me in the same year, right? You know, that seems kind of odd that that happened, doesn't it? But all these human beings failed me in the same year, and I was, like, just devastated. I was devastated. I was like, wow, like, what do I do now? I knew what to do. 
you guys have been telling me for five years, you know, you guys have been telling me for five years. And while I was just hanging out on the fringes of AA and I was just there to get my paper signed, I really heard some of what you said. I heard you telling me what I should do. I just hadn't been quite willing to do it just yet, you know? And at five years sober, when my world kind of crumbled around me, I was finally willing to reach out my hand to another woman in Alcoholics Anonymous and say, will you help me and will you work the steps with me? And she said yes. And so we started to work the steps in Alcoholics Anonymous, and this time it looked a little bit different than it did the first time. Uh, This time I started with one, which was a novelty, right? (laughs) Yeah, so this time I started with one, powerless, unmanageable. And at this point, it seemed pretty obvious to me. It seemed pretty obvious. Yeah, 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 I was 23 years old, sure. But I was not drinking like a normal 23-year-old, you know? I was not social drinking after work. I was not just just, uh, drinking like young people drink. Um, when I, I, the first time that I got drunk, I was 17. And that first time that I got drunk, uh, one wasn't enough. I got behind the wheel of a car. Uh, I drove home. I got sick. I blacked out and I passed out. And my drinking pretty much followed that pattern for many years, except I stopped throwing up because I developed a tolerance for alcohol. So I stopped getting sick. Um, but that's how my drinking was, you know, once it started, it wasn't enough. Um, and it progressed very quickly from the age of 17 to the age of 23, um, to being just every now and then when it was available to being an every weekend thing, you know, every weekend, Friday, get together with the boyfriend. We would get drunk. We would fight. We would make up on Saturday. We would get drunk Saturday night. We would fight. We would make up on Sunday and then we'd do it again the next weekend. Right. I was having fun. Were y'all having fun drinking? (laughs) Anyway. You know, and it very quickly progressed to, you know, from the weekends to, you know, let's throw in Wednesday, right? And then from Wednesday to the next day to the next day. And by the time I was 23 years old, I was drinking on a daily basis. Um, I had a job that I had arranged that I did not work during the day. I was waitressing, so I could do that. Um, I didn't work until the afternoon shift because I needed some time to get up and to get right before I could go to work. Uh, I didn't work day shifts. I had scheduled my life around my ability to drink like I wanted to. Um, I didn't really understand the whole, you know, if I'm controlling my drinking, I'm not enjoying, or if I'm enjoying, I'm not controlling. Um, And then when I stay sober long enough and I can look back with clarity, uh, between the time of the car accident and when I actually got sober, um, I drank, you know, many times during that. I didn't drive again, but Um, I drank several times, and one time I had gone out with some normal girls from work, um, and they were just going to go have a few beers, and so I go out with the girls to have a few beers. Isn't that cute? And um, and I didn't drink like them, right? Like, we're ordering beers, and I'm drinking two to their one, and after two, they're done, and I am so not, like, so not done, right? And um, so, but that night I stopped it, but I didn't enjoy, you know, that wasn't enjoying when I had to stop. Um, But then when I didn't have to stop, there was no control. You know, there was no control. Stopping was, there's either absolutely none left or or I'm completely blacked out and passed out. That was the stop, right? Um, You know, the other thing that that I think... um, That if I came into this program saying, oh, I'm not an alcoholic, it could have happened to anybody, you would think June 6th would have been enough, right? You would think June 6th, 1995 would have been enough for me to stop if I really didn't belong in this program, right? But June 6th wasn't enough. I was drunk the next week, and I was drunk several times after that. It wasn't enough. Probation wasn't enough. None of it was enough, right? Um, That's not social drinking. It's not normal drinking. Now, I didn't know that till I came here and listened to your stories. I should tell you, it's one of the most powerful things about Alcoholics Anonymous to me is that you share your story with me so that I can, so that I can identify and figure, figure this out, right? Figure out I do belong because you shared your story with me. I think there's this incredible amount of power in that, right? And so, okay, 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 perhaps my life is powerless, a little bit unmanageable. I don't know, maybe most 23-year-olds don't convict, you know, get convicted of four felonies or something, right? But whatever. Anyway, step one, yep. Step two and three I had completely shied away from. Um, You know, I had all those preconceived ideas and notions and uh, an idea of God that was impressed upon me as a child that I wanted nothing to do with, nothing to do with. Um, And so I came in very defiant about it all, very defiant. 
uh, when I was in prison, we would have meetings and we would um, stand in a circle when the meeting was done and everybody would say the Lord's Prayer. And I would stand in a circle and I would hold your hand because we would get in trouble if you didn't. And I wasn't about getting in trouble. Um, but as everyone said the Lord's Prayer, I wouldn't say it. I was like, yeah I, yeah, I know the words. I learned the words when I was a little girl and you cannot make me say this. Try, you know, very defiant, very defiant. I was not going to say it. Um, and I drug all that in here with me. I will tell you the chapter We Agnostics was written for someone just like me, right? It smashes every excuse that I have in this chapter, We Agnostics. Um, it says here, much to our relief, we discovered we did not need to consider another's conception of God. Our own conception, however inadequate, was sufficient to make the approach and to effect a contact with him. However inadequate. And my beginnings of a belief in a higher power were pretty inadequate, you know? started with just little baby steps. The first thing, the first glimpse of a higher power that I got in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous was because you all shared your stories with me. And when you all talked about your God that you had in your life, the higher power that you believed in your life, I felt that. And I believed you. I totally believed you. So the first thing that I believed was that you believed I could feel it. I could feel that you believed. I could tell you believed. I wasn't there, but I could just feel that you did, right? And then these funny little things called coincidences started happening in my life, right? A little coincidence here, a little coincidence there. And at some point, it's just unavoidable. Some point, it's just unavoidable that there is something going on here. I can't explain it. I don't understand it, but there is something going on here. Um, so my conception of God today, it's all been a big journey, right? But my conception of God today is this. So picture this. You ready? There's a mama duck, and there's a whole bunch of little baby ducks following the mama duck, right? If you ever watch ducks, I really like ducks, okay? If you ever watch little baby ducks following a mama duck, like, they aren't going like, hey, mama, where we're we going, you know? Like, hey, mama, when are we going to be there, right? They're following the mama duck blindly. They're just following. Mama's going, and I'm following. I'm just following, right? And the baby ducks just follow the mama. You know, they go through water. They puddle through water. They just follow blindly and trusting, right? Um, and that's what God looks like to me, right? That's what God looks like. Step three to me is, remember, Tammy, you are a baby duck, right? <laughs> You are not the mama duck. Sometimes I still want to be the mama duck because <laughs> I have some good ideas. But um, <laughs> but if I can just remember, you know, if I can just remember, if I can remember that when I look back, the things that happen when I put myself in God's hands are better than anything I could have planned. If I can just remember that and remember that I'm a baby duck and follow and I don't need to know all the details of the journey and I don't even need to know where I'm going, right? Just follow. Just follow. Steps four and five, you know, step four, write an inventory. Uh, so I write an inventory. Steps one and two are easy. I'm mad at you because you, that's easy, right? Like I got, I got that down. Uh, but then the next steps, like what did I do to set the ball rolling and what are the character defects? And that's where the awareness begins. Uh, the awareness of me begins and the things that I've done and, uh, and the whys and the patterns and all of that. Step five in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, it says, if we skip this vital step, we may not overcome drinking. Uh, there's this girl in my home group who says the big book is full of death threats. <laughs> you know, it's funny, but if you ever like read, like seriously, and I always think if we skip this vital step, we may not overcome drinking. And then it says to drink is to die. And I'm like, ah, so yeah, I think there's something to it. Right. And so, uh, you know, the biggest thing I got from doing a, a fifth step or any fifth step in Alcoholics Anonymous is a, a, a sense of belonging, right? to sit in front of another woman and say things out loud that are just traumatic to me or devastating to me and to have her look at me and nod her head and say, I understand, you know, I've done that too. Or if I haven't done that, I know people who've done that. Right. And that suddenly I'm not alone in this big world. Right. I'm not alone in this big world that somebody understands in the sense of belonging, sense of belonging here, a sense of belonging in the world, just a sense of belonging that comes for me, was doing a fifth step. 
Um, six and seven, right in the middle of everything, right? Uh, not very much talked about, um, not very much written in the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous about six and seven, but right in the middle of everything, pivotal, pivotal steps, right? Um, they talk about character building in the 12 and 12, and I love the idea of character building. Doesn't it sound lovely? Character building. I want to build character. Don't you want to build character? So... Yeah, which is all great and good until I realized that the whole idea of character building means that I am now aware of who I am, and now it is my choice to do something different, right? Ouch. Whew, that's, that's a tall order, right? Uh, but the awareness, the awareness that comes with six and seven and the choice to do something different, such as eight and nine, right? Actually go make amends for things that I have done wrong. Um, that's a novel idea, but... Um, yeah, and we started with those. So, so when I did my, I've done a few, a few fourth and fifth steps now. But uh, when I did um, one early days, um, you know, there are some amends that I told you about, you know, very early on in talking tonight that I just couldn't make. Uh, I just couldn't make those amends. Like I knew there was an amends that needed to be made. I just couldn't make it. And um, you know, but at this point, I'm I'm on no, I'm I'm in AA. I'm not sitting around the fringes anymore, and I'm participating in my own sobriety and amazing things happen, right? If we stay. So, um, what I discovered is, um, there came a point where I was ready to make those amends. And, um, I don't know when I became ready, but there was a point where I just became ready and I knew I was ready. And so I went and dug up all the police reports with everybody's names and phone numbers and made an appointment with the phone. And, um, I sat down, I was six and a half years sober. So it would have been about seven years after the car accident. Uh, and I sat down with the phone and, um, and I dialed, uh, a phone number and the first phone number that I dialed was the man whose wife was killed in the car accident. And it's seven years later and I'm thinking the chances of me getting a hold of anybody are pretty slim. And, uh, and I dialed the phone number and this man answered the phone and I asked for him and he said it was him and, I said, my name is Tammy Skyby, and I don't know if you know who I am. And he said, I know who you are. Of course he did. Like, how could he not know who I was, right? How silly of me to think that he wouldn't know who I was. But um, I proceeded to tell that man how sorry I was for my actions and how they had harmed his family. And I would tell you that a phone call to somebody seven years later is a pretty lame attempt to right a wrong, but it's all that I had. It's all that I had right then. Um, that man proceeded to tell me that life had been hard. Um, his daughter was injured in the car accident. Um, he said it had been very hard. Her, her injuries were severe and her recovery was uh, painful. Uh, he said he missed his wife. He said he didn't understand why it happened. Um, and at the end of it all, he said, I forgive you. And I will tell you that on that phone call, I completely did not understand that. Completely did not understand that. I proceeded to call the other family and I wasn't able to get in touch with them. Uh, there was a truck driver involved in the car accident. He didn't do anything wrong. Um, he ended up hitting me, but not but because of me. Um, I did get in touch with him and I told him who I was. And I said, I was the girl driving the 1995 Mustang who caused that car accident. And he said, I remember that. He said, that was the worst car accident. And I saw in all of my years driving a truck. And I said, I just want you to know how sorry I am for my actions and how much trouble that they caused you. And he said, I forgive you. And I will tell you, when I hung up the phone, I completely did not understand that. Over the course of the next few years, I started sending Christmas cards to the truck driver and to that family. Um, the truck driver very quickly started um, sending me Christmas cards back. He would send me a Christmas card. He'd say, Merry Christmas. And he'd send me a little scratch-off lottery ticket, you know, win some money. And, um, and I started talking to him on the phone every now and then. He would just randomly call me every now and then and just say, I was just thinking about you. How you doing? You know, I was just worried about you. You were on my mind. How you doing? Several years later, I got to meet that man. Um, he met me for dinner and um, I just had some questions and he was, he was kind enough and generous enough to meet me and to 
answer my questions so that, just so I knew, just so I knew. Um, and over the course of the years, I sent my Christmas card every year. Um, when I was nine years sober, I got a Christmas card in the mail, and I didn't recognize the address, and I opened it, and this little red and green confetti fell out, and um, it was from that little girl. Um, that little girl was seven when the car accident happened, and I was nine years sober, so she would have been about 16. And she sent me a Christmas card, and she said, Merry Christmas to you and your family. And I thought maybe it was a mistake or she didn't know who I was, but I sent my Christmas card the next year and she sent me a Christmas card back. Um, and over the course of the next several years, I sent a Christmas card every year and she sent me a Christmas card back every year. And over the course of the years, I had the opportunity to tell her how grateful I was for her and her family, how powerful their forgiveness of me was. Um, I had an opportunity to share my life and share my sobriety anniversary with them every year right around Christmas time. And over the course of the years, that little girl shared her life with me. She told me she was graduating from high school. And then she told me she was going to graduate from college. She told me along the way that her father was her hero and he was a very hardworking man. She told me that she'd met a nice young man and she was going to get married. And she always told me how happy she was for me that I was still sober and how happy she was that, you know, I could sometimes have the opportunity to share her story and that it helped people. The last Christmas card I got from her was 2016. And in the Christmas card in 2016, she said that, that her family learned their forgiveness from her mother. She said her mother was a very, she taught them that. She said that every year her mother would take her to the mall and she would buy her these little cards of inspiration to hand out to other people. And she said she's taken up that tradition from her mother and she's gone to the mall and she's bought some little inspirational cards. And she said, I want you to have one. And she sent me an inspirational card with a little message on it. And she said, keep doing your good works. So I'm a girl who, at the age of 23, caused a terrible car accident that caused a woman to lose her life. And these people not only forgave me, they let me into part of their life. Like, I don't deserve that. I don't deserve that. You know what I've learned over the course of staying sober? You know, our big book, talks about forgiveness a lot, right? And it tells me that I can't hold on to hate and anger and live in the sunlight of the spirit. And what I know today is those people knew that. They knew that they couldn't hate or be angry and live in their own sunlight of the spirit, whatever that looks like, right? That they had to forgive me so that they could let their own God's light shine into their life, right? They had to do that. So what I know today with no uncertainty is that their forgiveness of me had nothing to do with me. They forgave me before I ever picked up the phone. They would have forgiven me if I would have never picked up the phone. I just got to be a part of it because I did, you know. I just got to hear the message because I did. And I'm so grateful for it. Uh, I don't get Christmas cards anymore, um, you know, but that's not not for me to determine. I still send one every year and, um, I'm happy I got them. I'm happy I got them for all those years that I got them. I'm so grateful for that. Um, and then we go on to steps 10, 11, and 12, you know, rinse and repeat, build my relationship with God, <laughs> carry the message, practice the principles, carrying the message not so hard practicing the principles depends on the environment i'm in so do really good practice the principles like a professional in the rooms of alcoholics anonymous and then you take me out of these rooms and we get a little dicey there so um i've got a job right now that i'm doing really well practicing the principles but um i decided it was a good idea to get into a relationship about a year and a half ago and it gets a little bit sketchy there so anyway um <laughs> So over the course of over the course of the next years, I start to participate in my sobriety. 
You know, uh, when I'm eight years sober, I finally graduate from college. I was in my early 30s, and I started going to college when I was drinking, and I finished college when I got sober. Um, two years after that, the day before my 10-year sobriety anniversary, the state of Texas gave me some more letters put behind my last name, which uh, have helped my career and opened doors for me and um, allowed me to have a very successful career. So um, all that's great, right? Um, but some really cool things have happened. Um in December of 2014, I got a phone call from this young man, and he said, um, we're having a little conference here in the state of Louisiana for the young people, and we were wondering if you could come talk. And he said it, it was in June, and I, was, I looked at my calendar, and I said, I'm sorry, I already have a commitment that weekend. I'm not going to be able to make it. And he said, well, thank you very much. And when I hung up the phone and I looked at my calendar, uh, I had tickets to go see The Illusionists at the theater. So I already had a commitment, right? Um, but when I looked at my calendar again, I realized that that young man had asked me to come speak on June 6, 2015. That's kind of how I felt, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, what are the chances? Like, what are the ch He didn't ask me to speak on June 5th. He didn't ask me to speak on June 7th. It was a whole weekend conference. He asked me to speak on June 6th, 2015. And you know you know that feeling you can't quite shake? Yeah? Couldn't quite shake it. And I called him back, and I said, I think I have made a mistake. And he, I said, am I still, you know, invited? He said, we would love to have you. So I gave away my tickets to go see The Illusionist. And on June 6, 2015, on the 20-year anniversary of that woman's death, I was at the state conference of young people in Louisiana getting to share their story of forgiveness. There is no better way I can think to honor that woman's life and to honor that family than to do to be have the opportunity to do something like that on the 20 year anniversary of her death. You know, what an opportunity that was. After I spoke that evening, a young man came up to me and he said, hey, I know a girl in the Houston area and I think she could benefit from hearing your story. Can I have her call you? And I said, sure. Um, and she did. Um, and her name is Morgan and she was awaiting her sentencing for uh, being a drunk driver who killed somebody in a car accident. Uh, my car accident happened when I was 23. Hers happened when she was 20 or 21. My car accident happened on June 6th. Hers happened on June 7th like 20 years later, but, um, and so we got together, I picked her up and we had dinner and we shared our stories. Uh, she got sentenced a little bit later that year and she got, uh, sentenced to a six year term, uh, in TDC. Uh, I found her information and I started to write her letters and we started a correspondence, um, correspondence through the mail, just sharing our stories. And we would share our June 6th and we'd share our June 7th and we'd share our sobriety. Um, and she would write to me and she said, Tammy, you know, you understand like nobody else will really understand, you know. Uh, a couple of years ago, I found out that even though I'm a, 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 a TDC approved volunteer in the state of Texas, I can go visit her uh, because we had a relationship before she went in. So I disclosed our relationship and I got on her visitation list and I now go see her about once a quarter. And I've been to see her probably four or five times and I'm going to go see her in April. And we're hoping she gets out any minute, you know, any day now. She's eligible for parole. So can't wait till she gets out to, so she can join us in Alcoholics Anonymous on the outside in the Houston area. Um, and it, it's just been, it's been a joy and a pleasure to have that relationship with her. But you do, which what I want you to know is that when I answered the phone that first time, I said, I'm sorry, I have another commitment, right? And what happened is, you know, God spoke. And not only did I go to that conference and get to honor that woman's memory on June 6, 2015, I got to have a relationship with this young lady um, who has the same charge as me, and we've gotten to form a relationship now, right? And you know what? If I wouldn't have been there, I would have missed it. I would have missed it. I would have missed it if I would have said no. Um, and you know what? I got to go see the illusionist later. It was no big deal, right? <laughs> I got to see him. So, uh, life is good. You know, my 23rd year sober was probably the best year ever. It started out uh, recovering from a 
from a surgery that I'd had. I uh, lost a little bit of weight. It was great. It wasn't a surgery for that, but whatever. Um, that sounded weird. Sorry. Um, so anyway, so it started out recovering, you know, from the surgery and, you know, life was good. And then June 6th roll, rolls around in um, 2018. June 6th rolls around. And I always struggled with June 6th. Like, I always knew it was June 6th, right? I knew. I'd wake up and I would say a special prayer for the family and go about my day. And at the end of the day, I just always was like, I was supposed to do something. And I just could never quite figure out what it was I was supposed to do, right? Um, I would always go to a meeting or do whatever I did and, and somehow show gratitude in some action way. But I would always go home and think, I missed the mark. I don't know. And I'd been talking to my sponsor about it. And in 2018, I talked to her a couple of days before June 6th. And I said, you know, June 6th is coming up, and I always just feel like I'm supposed to be doing something, but I don't know what it is. And, um, you know, I talked about making a living amends, and she said, well, why don't we try to look at it as just right living instead of a living amends? And something about that just really resonated, and I was like, okay. And so June 6th, 2018, um, it's a Wednesday. It's the first Wednesday of the month, and my day to go to Plain State Jail is the first Wednesday of the month. And so I go to work. Um, I'm a good employee. Um, and then I leave and I go to my meeting at Plain State Jail because it's the first Wednesday of the month. And we go and we have a meeting and I talk about what day, what the day is, uh, why it's important to me, um, how I'm, you know, grateful for Alcoholics Anonymous and, and the program and, and all that. Um, when the meeting was over, this young woman walked up to me and I'd never seen her before. And she walked up to me and she said, I want to thank you for coming. She said, I have the same charge as you have, you know, and I really needed to hear what you said tonight. I never saw her before, and I haven't seen her since. But there was something about that night that I felt like that girl coming up to me, shaking my hand and saying, I needed to hear what you had to say, was God saying, it's okay, Tammy. You know, it's okay. What you're doing is, it's enough. You know, it's enough. So on the 23rd anniversary, I finally felt like just being a good member of society, just going to work, keeping my commitments, going to my meeting in prison, that that's what I was supposed to be doing, and it was enough, right? It didn't have to be anything else. Shortly thereafter, I just had that feeling that I, and I probably knew it before, but just that feeling that everything in my life is enough, you know? I remember drinking, you know, the whole idea of drink is how much alcohol is enough, right? More, right? How much money is enough? More. How much recognition is enough? More. How much anything is enough? More. It was never, ever enough. And just after that June 6th thinking, you know, everything in my life is enough. I have enough of everything, you know? It doesn't mean my life is perfect. As a matter of fact, I was having such a great year that I decided dating would be a good idea. <laughs> right. And then, you know, I want to be the mama duck. <laughs> so, you know, so anyway, so, you know, that's always a challenge for me. Like, lovely character defects come out that were laying dormant quite nicely before then. So, um, you know... <laughs> So that's what happens with me. And, um, you know, and it's been a challenge. It's been a challenge for me to practice the principles in my home. You know, I, it's just been a challenge for me to do that. And it's not all puppy dogs and rainbows. And uh, I feel like there's a whole bunch of growth and learning happening with me the last couple of years. And I don't know what's going to happen with that. It's whatever's going to happen is going to happen, right? And, you know, it's always good, though, for me to remember that, you know, these principles aren't meant to just be practiced in Alcoholics Anonymous. These principles aren't just meant to be practiced at work or with my family. Or they're meant to be practiced in my home, too. They're meant to be practiced everywhere that I go. And I still have work to do. I still have work to do because I miss the mark on that and miss the mark on that. Um, you know, I'm almost out of time, but I want to tell you that, you know, my road, my journey to find a higher power and, and get here has just been it's been, it's been a journey, right? It's been a journey. And, 
you know what happens to me today uh, after we finish our meetings in Texas and we stand up at the end of the meeting and hold hands to say the Lord's Prayer. I say the Lord's Prayer, you know, with everybody in those meetings. And I don't say the Lord's Prayer in those meetings because it has some deep spiritual meaning to me because it doesn't to me. Um, I say the Lord's Prayer and I hold hands with you because I want what you have, because I want to be a part of Alcoholics Anonymous and I don't want to be different and I don't want to set myself apart. And I'm not saying you have to say it. I'm saying that that's why I do it. And today I don't fight that anymore and I'm not defined about it anymore, right? Because my higher power looks different than yours. It's okay. We all belong, right? Um, it, we don't have to have the same higher power. We are all welcome, you know, to our seat in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I think it's a beautiful, wonderful thing. And I want to close with this. It's the last paragraph of the doctor's opinion. It says, I earnestly advise every alcoholic to read this book through. And though perhaps he came to scoff, he may remain to pray. And at the age of 23, when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I was here to scoff. I was here to get out of trouble and be on my merry little way. And I could not be more grateful that today I can look back and tell you with no uncertainty that when I put myself into God's hands and your hands, so much better things happened. And I hope that I stay and I hope that you stay. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.